Okay, we're going to talk about wise decisions, but I have some questions to answer. Here's the first one. At 10, we are taught to tarry for the Holy Spirit, to speak in other tongues. I don't hear teaching on receiving the gift of tongues in this church. Does this church believe in speaking in tongues? I never hear it. I feel out of place when I speak them. Um, one thing I would say, this is a great opportunity to answer a question you didn't ask. One of the things on my heart is I, if you come to Mountain West over a 10-year period, you're going to hear the full counsel of God's word. Um, I planned my preaching about a year ahead, and we are planning so that you would hear the full counsel of God's word over a 10-year um, period, all 66 books, 1,189 chapters. And I want to do that three times and then retire, and me and my wife are going to ride off into the sunset. <laughs> but um, one of the things is we do preach the whole counsel of God, and we will get to that. In fact, we're preaching Acts chapter 2 um, in the third or fourth Sunday in April of 2023. So mark that in your calendar if that was your question. We're going to talk about Acts chapter 2. And if you need a small group, my small group on Thursdays is walking through the book of Acts. So those are two opportunities. But to answer your question quickly, and all of these questions I could speak an hour for, but I'm just going to give you a snippet. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we also believe that God has called us to um, move in decency and in order. And so um, Paul says, I wish that you would speak five words that people can understand over thousands um, that people don't understand. In fact, he says, I speak in tongues more than all of y'all, but I want that to happen. Um, I wish that people could understand. So we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we also believe that it is done in decency and in order. Um, and we teach the whole counsel of God. Second question. How do I let go of shame as being a believer? Okay, shame, um, shame is an emotion, okay? And shame, and the thing about emotions is emotions are real, but they're not always right. And you have to filter emotions through the lens of, I affirm that the feeling I have is real, but is it true and is it right? And the thing about shame is that shame comes from the enemy, and shame is a lie that the enemy tells us. And the enemy only lies when it's almost true. And shame is com and conviction are very close, uh, but they're two different things. Shame wants to keep you stuck in a cycle of remembering the mistakes of your past. And conviction wants to point you to a hope that you can have in the future. And here's what scripture says. For there is now no condemnation, no shame for them that are in Christ Jesus. So you, ex you move on from shame by accepting the truth of God's word over the lie of the enemy. Here's the next one. How do I pull down strongholds How can or overcome strongholds? How can I be faithful and for God to forgive me if there are strongholds? First question, how do I pull down strongholds? Um, a stronghold is a lie that you believe. Strongholds start in your mind, and they are based off of faulty thinking. It's a lie that you believe. And the way you pull down a lie is to expose it to the truth. So any stronghold that you are dealing with um, comes from a lie from the enemy, and you speak the truth of God's word over that lie. And Scripture says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. How can you be faithful to God? It is not about you being faithful to God. It's about you resting in the faithfulness of Jesus. That if you let him transform you, you that he will make you into the person that he wants you to be step by step, a next step at a time. And then how can God forgive you if there are strongholds? If you can confess it and repent it, God is faithful and just to forgive it. He, this is another one of those lies that the enemy tells you, that God can't forgive that. In fact, Many of you are walking around in shame of something you did before that God says, I've already thrown that in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't know what you're talking about. That don't live here no more. I've already forgiven it. And who are you to hold on to what God has already forgiven? Okay, last one. As a follower of Christ and firm believer in God since a child, how am I having such a hard time navigating God's direction? How do I get back on track? How do I make the wise choice? And I'm going to use that as a launching pad for our message today. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for this day. I pray that you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, in my house, we are in the season of Christmas. And one of the things my wife is 
adamant about is us watching Hallmark movies. Every night, there's a Hallmark movie that we are watching. And it's not really my cup of tea, but it's the tea that's served in my house, so I'm drinking it, okay? <laughs> and so, we are watching the Hallmark movies. Um, one, last night, we were watching, uh, I fell asleep on her watching the movie. It watched me. But um, there's one movie that we watch called The Notebook. That's not Hallmark, but it's a classic romantic movie, and it over and over, it just tells a story of love. This guy, Noah, he falls in love with this girl, and um, they don't see each other. And then finally, they get to the point, and she's in the valley of decision. She's got this guy who makes sense for her, but then she likes Noah, and Noah is asking her, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And y'all, I've never identified with something more. Not because, you know, I'm unsure of what I want. That's all I want. My wife, we good. But in my house, one of the most uh, difficult decision-making moments is when I ask, what do you want to eat? <laughs> yep. Some of you husbands uh, suppressing that laugh because you know she's going to give you a sideways look. It's okay. But it looks like this in my house. I say, okay, uh, well, what do you want to eat? I don't know. Well, how about this? No. How about that? No. Well, what do you want? I don't know. Okay. Just me? All right. Amen. That's fine. (laughs) But every now and then, you know, there are silly decisions like that, simple decisions like that. But every now and then, you come across difficult choices in your life. Is this the job that I need to go for or not? Is this the person that I should marry or not? Is this the house that I should buy or not? Should I sell? Should I stay? Should I go? Sometimes we come to these crossroads in life and we're wondering how do we make the right choice? How do we make a decision that honors God? And my dad told me this as I was going to college. He said, son, the choices you make today will create the man you will be in your future. And if I could say it largely in this room, You are the sum total of the decisions you made yesterday. That your today that you're walking in is rooted and related to all of the small, what seem like insignificant choices that you made before. And the thing that God wants us to do is he really wants us to make decisions that honor him. And so many times we get stuck. You ever have a delayed decision-making syndrome? I just made that up. But you just feel stuck and you, you're unsure because you just want to make the right choice. You want to make the right decision. C- can I say, instead of trying to feel like there is only one right choice, can I frame it like this? Instead of asking what is the right thing to do, we need to ask what is the wise thing to do. Wisdom is a little bit different than right or wrong. Right or wrong is black and white. Wisdom is related specifically to you. And uh, there's a book I read by Andy Stanley. It's called Ask It. It revolutionized my life. It says, based on who you are and where you are now and where you are going, what is the wise choice for you to make in this moment? One of the things we don't do enough of is tell the truth about who we are, okay? You know, some of you, you buy them cookies and say, hey, that's going to be for somebody else in the house. I'm not going to touch it. And 1.30 a.m. come, and there you go in the pantry grabbing them cookies. Tell the truth (laughs) about where you are. And wisdom says, based on who I am, all the flaws and all of who I am, and where I am in my life, and where I'm going, What is the wise choice for me to make? And friends, God wants you to make wise decisions. Our biblical passage today exposes us to a man who is called by God, anointed by God, but makes a really dumb choice. He makes a choice that ultimately begins to affect not only his life, but the lives of so many people connected to him and uh, his family and future generations. It really messes up his world in a, a big way. David is called from a shepherd field. God anoints him. He calls him. He puts him forward. But David makes an unwise choice. And Drake says, in every loss, there is a lesson. And I believe in David's life, there are some lessons for us on how to make Make wise choices. Four ways that I believe that we can make wise choices help us move forward 
And here's the first one. Wise choices start with the right thinking. Right? The right thinking, the right frame of mind will help you make the right choices. Here's what scripture says, Proverbs 23 and 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Here's what Romans 12 and 2 says. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, wise decisions start with right thinking and In order to have right thinking, you've got to be in the right frame of mind. This was the challenge for David. One of the things we always ask what we should be doing on our way climbing the ladder of success, but a question that isn't written about often enough is what do you do after you've achieved everything that you wanted to? What's your next step after you've had some success? This is where David finds himself. He has fought Goliath and slew Goliath. He has fought the Philistines and destroyed the Philistines. He has run from Saul and Saul was defeated. He is on the throne. He has accomplished so many things. And he's asking the question, now what? Now what do I do? How do I move forward? And because he was in that state of mind, he ends up making a choice to not go where he was supposed to be. Here's what verse 1 says. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, but he stayed behind. I can't tell you, friends, how many times me making unwise choices was rooted in me being in the wrong place, right? Y'all mama ever said you in the wrong place at the wrong time? Here's one of the key indicators that you are in Uh, The wrong frame of mind is when you are in the wrong place. If you're in a place that you know you should not be in, a place you know that is not what I'm really about and what I'm supposed to do, that is a key indicator that you are in the wrong frame of mind to be making any decisions. Here's how I like to say it. David positioned himself in the wrong place, but when you are in the wrong position, you will make decisions that will lead you in the wrong direction. Whenever you are in the wrong place, wrong decision, wrong position, you will make decisions that will lead you in the wrong direction. You don't make wise decisions when you're in the wrong headspace. Here's how I I like to frame it um, with couples that I counsel is that don't make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. Okay? You get hot and bothered for a moment. Do not allow that to drive the vehicle of your decision-making capabilities because you will make a decision that is not always in your best interest. Don't make decisions when you are super sad. Don't make decisions when you are uh, super angry. You have to be in the right frame of mind to make wise decisions and wise choices. Here's the second thing. is wise decisions require us to be willing to listen to sound advice. This is a big one because most of the time before we make a wrong choice, somebody has told us don't do that, right? Most of the time, I see this with my children. I say don't touch that, he touch that, he get hurt, then cry and come to daddy. I get it. I'm sure the Lord looks at me and says the same thing. I told you don't do that. In in the um, life of Moses, Moses was trying to do everything on his own. And Moses' father-in-law comes to him and says, this is silly, man. You've got to be willing to hear the voice of somebody who has wisdom and speaks wisdom into your life. Here's what Exodus 18, 17 through 19 says. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You are gonna wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me. Let me give you a word of advice and may God be with you. If you are willing, God is speaking and he will send wisdom and advice so that you won't make unwise decisions. In my life, uh, the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like my wife, Um, you know, or, you know, God uses her to tell me what I'm too hard of hearing to do. 
Uh, one time we were engaged actually, and I was serving at a church, and I was at that church, and uh, my wife told me this, there was this guy who was trying to become my friend and connect, and she was just like, I don't like him. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You do, uh, that makes no sense. She was like, every time I get around him, I get a headache. I don't like him. You, you need to stay away from him. And I, you know, to her point, he did have a weird voice and it was a challenge, but I, I didn't understand. And she just kept on me. You need to stay away from him. Lo and behold, about a week before, um, a week before something happened, I just finally gave in to the nagging and I said, all right, I'll, I'll back away. A week later, came out, he had split five churches and he was coming and trying to do the same thing at the church I was serving at. And I would have missed the voice of the Lord in my life through my wife if I would have silenced that. And here's what I I want y'all to understand. If you are willing to listen, God uses people to give us wisdom or give us advice on the choices we make. He gives us wisdom. Here's what Proverbs 12 and 15 says. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Proverbs 15 and 22. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. When I look back over my life, I can trace when I have made unwise decisions. They happen in isolation and they happen without counsel. Think about it for a minute. When you made your big uh uh-oh, normally, uh, uh, we ain't going to be honest in church like we don't got uh uh-ohs, okay? (laughs) Normally, it's happening because we silenced the advice of somebody else or we did not seek the advice and wisdom of somebody else. And let me help us all in the room. We don't know the whole picture. All of us have blind spots, and what the Lord will do is put people in our lives to help widen our lens and our view to help us see the blind spots that we won't see on our own. And he sends these people of wisdom in our life, but we've got to be willing to listen to it. And I know you probably read this passage, and you may have skipped over it, but God sent this even in David's life. In verse 4, um, Verse three, rather, uh, it says, and David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? This person, whoever said it, put their neck on the line because they were really saying to David, wait a minute, think about this. This is Bathsheba, aka you know her. Here's the second thing, David. She is married But she's not just married, she's married to Elam. Now what uh, 1 Chronicles tells us is Elam is one of David's mighty men. Or uh, she's the daughter of Elam rather, one of David's mighty men. That's his daughter. The next thing, she is married to Uriah the Hittite, which is in David's inner circle, who's been with David for many, many years. And what this scripture doesn't tell us, but we know through the larger context, is that she's the granddaughter of David's most closest advisor. Here's what the person is saying. David, this is too close. You're going to blow this thing up. This is dumb. Don't do it. Here's what verse 4 said. So David sent messengers and took her. Wisdom was present, but he ignored it. And friends, if we are going to make wise decisions, our ears have to be attuned and open to the wisdom that God is sending us. And do not ignore wisdom just because it doesn't come in the package that you expect it. God will send wisdom through the mouth of a donkey and the mouth of your mama and everything in between. You've got to recognize wisdom where it shows up in your world. Here's the third thing, is that wise decisions value purpose over convenience. You got to value purpose over convenience. And consistently making wise decisions will result in you making the right God-honoring decisions for your life. Right? So many times we think this big choice right here is going to make or break us. It's consistently doing the wise thing that will lead you on the right path. 
is consistently choosing purpose over convenience. And let me, let me frame that conversation like this. The wise choice is taking the time to cook the home-cooked meal over the convenience of the microwave. Taking the time to do it the right way instead of rushing and doing it the convenient way. Uh, when I was about five and a half years ago, uh, we were in Tampa and I knew God was calling us to do something new and there were two opportunities presented to us and one was a shortcut to what I always wanted to do. The other was the long road to what I knew God had called me to do eventually. And in that valley of decision, I had to choose the long road of purpose over the shortcut of convenience. Because convenience will give you instant gratification but that instant gratification will not lead to long-term stability. And wise choices are following God where he is taking you. Here, here's what Moses had this very same fight. He was uh, raised in an Egyptian household, and he could have taken the convenience of living with Pharaoh's daughter, but he chose the purpose of God's ultimate plan for his life, which was to liberate the children of Israel. Here's what Hebrews 11:24 24 through 26 says. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Friends, God has a purpose for your life. God wants to do more with your life than you can imagine on your own. And what the enemy wants you to do is shortcut and circumvent his long-term goal by taking the easy road and the easy way out. And wisdom does not always feel easy. Here's a verse in uh, Hebrews. No discipline, let me insert wisdom, feels pleasant at the time but painful. But afterward, it produces a harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. Wisdom will let you end up where God always intended for you to be and not some cheap counterfeit of where God wants you to be. See, God's purpose in your life is greater than the convenience of this moment. And we've got to make the wise choice to follow after what God has designed and has for our life. But if we're honest in this room and in this moment, is we don't always make the wise choice. Well, let me not talk about y'all because y'all sweetly saved and uh, wonderful people. I don't always make the right choice. I mess up. I fail. I go the wrong way. But here's the good news, and here's the hope for everybody in this room. Unwise decisions are not the end of your story. Just because you have messed up, that is not the end of the story. And this is what the enemy wants you to believe. Because you messed up before, God can never use you again. Because you made the wrong choice, God can never turn it around. But I, I've got good news for you. God has a way of taking what the enemy intended for evil and turn it around for your good. God has a way of taking the ashes of your life and making beauty out of it. And if you are willing to submit the broken pieces, God still can write with broken crayons and he can put your life back together again. Your story is not over just because you've made a bad decision. There's still more for you. God still has more. Here's what 2 Samuel 12 and 13 says. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. See, God will redeem our bad choices if we turn to him. He'll redeem them. And I don't know what yours is, but there is nothing too hard for our God. He'll redeem the bad choices if we surrender it to him. Here's what Isaiah 61 verse 3 says. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. 
In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double portion of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. There's too many of us walking around unsure about the decisions that we need to make. Can, can I help you relieve some of that pressure? Psalm 32 and 8 says, God will instruct you on the pathway that you need to go. He's going to lead and order your step. And making the wise decision is relying on his strength and his wisdom to take you in the days ahead. And the wisest decision that some of us could make today is to say yes to Jesus. That today is the day that you say, you know what, I've tried everything else. I've done all sorts of other things. I I'm going to try to say yes to Jesus. Because he will make your life have an expected end, an expected hope. Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says God. Plans to prosper you, plans to give you, not to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. Today is the day that we start making wise choices that will lead us on the path that God always intended for us to go. Will you stand with me as we pray? And in a moment, I'm going to pray and our prayer partners are going to come down. And I'm believing if you're in the valley of decision today, if you know you need to make a choice, if you need prayer for any reason, our prayer partners will be here and we're going to pray with you and believe God to answer the request that you have. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word that you have shared with us today. God, thank you for reminding us that wisdom starts with the right thinking. Help us to be in the right frame of mind. A mind that's been transformed by you, Jesus. Lord, would you allow us to be open to the people you have placed in our lives who give us advice and wisdom. Help us to be aware that you have sent answers in many different ways. God, would you give us the strength to choose the, the purposeful thing over the convenient thing? so that you would be pleased. But ultimately, God, would you redeem the mistakes that we have made? Would you restore what, what has been broken in our world? Help us to follow after you. God, for the person who needs to say yes to you, I pray today would be their day. And if that's you, I want you to say this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. I choose you today. I receive your salvation today. And Father, I just pray over every person in this room. I pray for a spirit of wisdom to be released, God, that you would give them unusual wisdom and favor to make the right choices or the wise choices, God, that would honor you. And I pray, God, that as we take these steps forward, you would open up doors, you would create opportunities for your name to be glorified, and we will give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, and every heart say amen. Amen. Would you join us in worship?